Welcome to the Living Life to See podcast. I'm John Losey, your host and guide as we explore how we can be present and kind as we do great things. A few other places that you can find us. One is the Growing People podcast. It's a YouTube channel where we provide resources and insights on how people and groups develop. We've also got the Into Wisdom Group, which is a consulting company that not only does consulting and advising, but also does publishing through Into Wisdom Learning and then also productions around uh, doing virtual and hybrid conferences and meetings. The last thing is just on Friday, uh, the, the previous Friday as we're recording this, we uh, launched the Pottery Panda, which is a business fable about strategic planning. And you can get that uh, online. We're working on getting on an Amazon and also an electronic version, but you can always get it through going to PotteryPanda.com. So today we're privileged to have Jeannie Kim join us. Uh, Jeannie currently runs several different restaurants and food service operations, including Sam's American Eatery, Fermentation Lab, Divine Indulgence Catering Company, and also the overarching thing is Bridge Hospitality Management Group. But I'm not done yet. Jeannie also is on the board for two higher education institutions, the University of Redlands and San Francisco Theological Seminary. I got to know her in a role as a pastor. In fact, she officiated at my wedding that she did in both English and Korean. So welcome, Jeannie. Thank you, John, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and honor yeah. to be well, part of your podcast. <laughs> I know you're a busy person, so thank you for, I mean, from that bio, you can tell, but... I want to hear how you tell people what you do. I just listed a bunch of roles, but when somebody asks you, hey, Jeannie, what do you do? Well, how do you answer them? Um, I, I think it all depends who I'm speaking to. Uh, I, I tell them that I do my own uh, people ministry. <laughs> it's what I do. And that always gets the conversation going. Um, I've never felt like this was a job or a career, but more of a calling. So that gives me a lot of hope. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but, you know, it gives me an opportunity to meet people from all walks of life and uh, very interesting things that I learned from them. And uh, we do that through food and um, wine. So I'm actually fortunate <laughs> that we always involve food, you know, which is, um, I think, central to any relationship that we have with others. Hey, so. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about how running restaurants equals a people ministry. Uh, I think it starts with the leadership. Uh, for me, um, I don't have any uh, business background. I didn't go to school for business. Um, I never ran a business. Um, so other than my parents working at my parents' restaurant uh, when I was young uh, and told myself, I'm never going to do restaurant business because I see how hard it is. And, you know, I, I know how hard they worked and they just never, uh, it just never paid off, you know, for the amount of hours and the uh, sweat and energy that they had invested in. So I said, I'm never going to do business, but you know, you know, the rule, never say never. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I think, um, now I'm, I'm forgetting what you asked me. <laughs> oh, well, what I want to get to, well, you bring up a couple of things and I want to explore yes. later, but, but how do you use your restaurant businesses as a people ministry? I do it on a, a level with my leaders. So all my management people have been with me for over 10, 12 years. And I felt like if I can help them, you know, uh, to really become the best that they can be and teach them how to uh, take care of other people, then... I don't have to do a lot of work myself. So everybody's got a story. Everybody comes here because they have a story. You know, they left a place to come here. And I wanted this place to become a place where they grow, not just, you know, um, uh, I mean, they started so young. So now I, I see them, I'm like, wow, they got taller. They actually <laughs> you know, got older, but uh, emotionally, mentally, um, and also spiritually, 
you know, I've seen the growth a little bit at a time. So uh, that has been more like discipleship, you know, uh, work for me. And people come to restaurant because they're hungry. They want to eat and they want to meet people. So for us, uh, it's, it just gives us such an easy way for us to care for them because we meet their needs. Number one, we feed them. So uh, when they come, they're always at 50%. You know, and I tell them, make sure that they're happy and they're full and, and nourish them. And then you get to know who they are and uh, provide a home away from home for a lot of people. I'm curious because as you talk, and I know that we can talk about what uh, degrees you actually have, but I want to hear how the, what the word hospitality means for you, and why is it different than just a restaurant or a hotel? Uh, I I'm still uh, learning what it means, you know, uh, to be hospitable, you know, and I think hospitality uh, people just equate that as you know food and lodging and you know, uh, customer service. Um, hospitality for me is when someone comes into my establishment and we welcome them and make sure they are satisfied, you know, in, in so many different ways um, and welcome them as our own and feel cared for and loved before leaving to their next destination. I think uh, that's what it is. It's a lot like church, isn't it? <laughs> well, what you remind me of is uh, Henry Nowen's book, Reaching Out. He talks about the movement from hostility to hospitality and the importance of not of making room for a guest, not overwhelming them and yet not leaving them alone, mm -hmm. but creating a space where they can step in mm -hmm. and feel welcome, but also find themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't always happen but you create that space. And I think for me, um, being a 1.5 generation Korean American, that was always um, important. I, I think that is so crucial that, you know, no matter who you are, where you came from, having a safe place where you can be yourself, find yourself and uh, see yourself is, uh, crucial, you know. So, for my friends who don't know what at one point five, can you tell tell us a little bit about one point five generation? So, my parents will be uh, first generation. They immigrate here. I came here when I was eleven, you know. So, I'm not really a two second generation that was born or under ten years old, where uh, they can't they learn the language, you know, uh, English as a uh, primary language. But for me, I came after I finished fourth grade. So I knew how to speak Korean. I knew how to write and read Korean. Mm -hmm. And then assimilating into American culture and new language. Um, so we're kind of in between, like a middle child, you know, <laughs> trying to hold both. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that experience impact how you, uh, how you run restaurants, but also your your other vocation, which is pastoral stuff. How does, how did that 1.5 experience impact how you run things today? I think when I was young, I was um, probably bitter, you know, just because I felt like I had to do everything and I was in the middle of everything. Uh, but in retrospect, I think uh, that really helped me. It really equipped me uh, dealing with um, just being more diplomatic, you know, um, how to find peace, how to uh, delegate and, you know, uh, making the bridge. Yeah. Um, I mean, because you, you know, at Sam's, this is on Market Street. So you see people all walks of life. You see people who are politicians to police commissioners and homeless people. You get people from the theater, you know, a celebrity and, you know, people who are coming from um, across uh, the country and overseas. So uh, very interesting to help them understand what's going on, who we are, and what's happening in the city, you know. Yeah. So 
Um, well, uh, before we go further down that road, <laughs> let's back up a little bit. And I want to hear kind of how you got to where you are today. What's your origin story kind of, and and you get to hit the highlights of where you want to take it, but help people understand how you got to uh, doing people ministry through restaurants and, and catering and, and wine. Um, you know, I never... I know I'm an entrepreneur, but I never went to look for an opportunity. I think opportunity always came and, you know, I pray about it and think about how is this going to impact, you know, um, what we're doing now. And if I really feel like, hey, this, here's a really good opportunity, then I go with it, right? Um, for me, um, I went to seminary. I knew I always wanted to be in people um, ministry. Uh, I felt that I was called to be a missionary or parish ministry uh, ever since I was in high school. That was a calling that I felt very strongly. Um, and life happened, you know. Um, and I was you know, in this situation where I became a single mom with three kids and I had this family business that was failing and I thought okay what do I do and I was working in a church at the time but I was working only uh, part-time and there was no way I can do that and support the kids so I decided to take this on and instead of um, just giving up I said well let's see what this is gonna become and I started fixing. I knew this was going to be a temporary, you know, uh, thing. And I thought, yeah, I'll do this for about two, three years until kids grow up a little bit. And then I can go back to ministry. Um, and now that was, that's Sam's, right? That's Sam's. And so I named the restaurant uh, after uh, the initials of my kids, Samuel, Abigail, Micah. So it was all three. And Sam is the firstborn, Abby is the second, and Micah is the third. This is why everybody say, oh, is that because Samuel's the boy? He's the first. I said, no, it was just in that order. Um, and, you know, it was my goal was just, hey, I want to be able to support uh, the kids, make sure they graduate from high school and college. If this is the medium that I'm going to use and God has allowed me to uh, make that happen, then so be it. Let's make the best of it. So that was how it got started. And I didn't know how to run business. So what I did was I started make building relationship with my neighbors, all the hotels nearby. I took care of their staff, theaters, you know, um, got to be a very close friends with uh, theater staff. And, you know, we just kind of became a little community and supporting one another, you know, other restaurants too. So, uh, and City Hall, cause we're right in the heart of Mint Market. Like we're in the center of all the theater venues, the Civic Center, hotels, I mean, you know, and of course, uh, all the other small high-tech businesses as well, too. So, and that's where, like, you do a lot of catering for the theaters, correct? And the, that catering uh, just kind of came organically. I never wanted to open a catering business because I, it's a lot of work. But, um, you know, we started, th there was a demand um, and said, hey, we're getting this big company who's coming to the theater. They like to do catering. Can you guys provide some food? I'm like, sure, we can do that. And they really loved it. So it became more like, hey, can you just be our designated caterer? So when companies, I mean, we have Facebook, Stanford, YouTube, you know, these big corporations come and they buy 100, 200 tickets. They want to make sure food is part of that. And so um, we became a designated caterer. Um, and we said, why not? During the pandemic, we did a lot of catering work outside because nobody can come to mid market area. I mean, everything was shut down. So we started doing more um, uh, outside catering as well. So it just kind of grew organically. <laughs> Yeah, and then it, it it didn't turn out that you just stayed with Sam for a couple of years. Instead, no. you added another restaurant. 
Yeah, it's been almost 20 years, uh, believe it or not. I can't believe it's time just kind of flew by. And, you know, I felt like my, uh, my calling to support the kids, you know, um, that came to fruition because the youngest just graduated from college. So all three of them are graduated from college, thank God. Um, and so now it's, it's really about, okay, you know, what's my next goal? Let's start planning, you know, immediate goals and long-term goals. Um, you know, and then sometimes you just get these curveball like pandemic, right? <laughs> that yeah. throws everything. Yeah. Then you go, well, what do I do with this? You know, um, it's not like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Um, we need to shut down, but it's, it's like, how do we pivot from this and do what we do in a very different way? you know, context. And so, you know, for me, it was like, nobody can come here. Nobody wants to come here. Everything is shut down. Well, for me, it was easy. Well, if they can't come here, we'll go to them. So it, it was just that, you know, um, I, I guess, uh, uh, rationale, just like, oh, if they can't come, then we'll just go to them. Well, let's just get rid of all the menu that we have and just create some family meals. And I start driving two to 300 miles a day, delivering uh, food uh, all over the Bay Area. Uh, and thank God, because of the pandemic, there was no traffic. Yeah. <laughs> it made it so much easier. Um, but yeah, we, we uh, drove. I started driving to deliver. And then, you know, we have more orders. So I had my managers, you know, uh, driving. So we, we would go different, you know, um, uh, locations and that's how we survived and so many different places didn't have the presence of mind to just think differently of like well you you made the simple connection of they can't come here we can go there mm -hmm. there's other places that just they they were so entrenched in the way that they thought that they couldn't make that pivot mm -hmm. yeah. right and you know for me um I have, uh, you know, my first job, believe it or not, when I became 13, you're able to work, you know, um, and my first job was working for a community, Korean community center. And back then, I was still learning English, right, because I'm new, I didn't even know alphabet when I first got here. So I'm still learning, but I wanted to work. And I started working with senior citizens, Korean senior citizens. And they told me after work, you know, I worked about two to three hours. They said, you need to take this grandma and, you know, help her get to social security office. That's your job for today. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Then you start learning about who they are, you know, hear their stories. And, you know, most of the time, it's a very heartbreaking stories that they share. And so um, uh, it was interesting during the pandemic, uh, Korean um, community center reached out to me and said, look, we have hundreds of seniors who are not able to go shopping anymore. Uh, they have no transportation and they can't cook because some of these senior housing, they don't have stove for, um, you know, obvious reasons, like they, you know, they don't want to have fire. So they have microwave and refrigerator. So we're in this dilemma, but we don't have a lot of money <laughs> to support. Can you help us? So I thought, well, I'm, we're not a Korean restaurant, um, but I'm sure we can work something out. You know, um, I don't have grandparents on both sides. Um, and that's always been a very uh, uh, dear place for me. I was like, yeah, I used to work with senior citizens. Let me, let's help them. And that kind of became um a project of ours to provide 600 containers of korean food you know every week and we would provide it so they would eat for the whole week uh, so it kind of came around in full circle you know yeah. um and so it was like okay this is working you yeah. know they can't come to us we're going to them <laughs> so so I like to talk about like, especially life transitions in the show. And, and I think that like, I'm really curious because you, 
found you you knew your identity in high school that you wanted to be in ministry somehow uh, whether it was a mission or, or a parish pastor or something like that um and then that's what you went to school for and then i'm assuming it was an interesting transition when you became a restaurateur mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that transition what were some of the difficulties of it and how did you manage your transition um you know i I had always created this picture perfect of what kind of family I wanted, how I wanted to raise, you know, our kids and, you know, uh, and probably I got married for wrong reasons. Uh, I wanted to be in ministry. And back then I didn't see any female, um, you know, ministers. Uh, and so there was, there was a lot of concern about women being a missionary or women being in ministry at church. Um, so they say, well, one of the criteria is you got to be married. <laughs> so you can have stability and, you know, not have any issues. And I'm like, okay, that's just one thing I can just check off the list. Nah, There's some pretty thing. challenging assumptions in that. <laughs> I know I was too naive and too young and too stupid to really think about what that means. Uh, but I was like, yeah, it can't be that hard, you know. Um, and then, you know, life threw all these curveballs. Me, I'm going, I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. Yeah, you what can only, do? you can only like control half of that equation. Exactly. I could only control what I do, you know. And um, it was not a pretty, um, you know, separation. It was more for safety, and I found myself, you know, with the kids, you know, where, okay, I need to now financially support myself and the kids, and I don't really know how to do this, and um, and I didn't even know. I mean, I, I was probably in the worst situation, you know, I had gone through a divorce, but, it, you know, uh, I didn't get any financial support. I didn't even know how to get that. And, you know, uh, financially, you know, um, there was a bankruptcy, which I didn't even know. Uh, my ex-husband had, you know, um, filed and I was involved in that. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. And, you know, then you go, okay, um, I've never been good about doing things financially. I have to learn it. <laughs> And I don't know, I love cooking and, and doing things for the family, but I don't know how to do this on a restaurant scale, but that was the only option I had. And so, you know, it was a hard decision. I pretty much said, okay, God, I, I feel like this is where I need to pause parish ministry and do something different, you know, um, and that's where I felt like this is uh, temporary. I'm not leaving ministry. I'll be back. Um, and I started to work. Like I was working 16 hours a day uh, trying to figure out how to do this. Um, and the kids, they they grew up pretty fast. So look, you're young, but you all have a role to play. Yeah. Hey, here's uh, how to do laundry. You're going to have to help mommy. Here's how to do dishes. You know, here's how to clean, um, clean the house. And it became more of a fun project for them. It, it wasn't a chore. You know, they're like, oh, that's really cool, mom. Okay. Just put the dishes in and press the button. Wow. This is like magic. That's right. Well, <laughs> it's magic. Yeah. So it seems like, like you say you've never been to business school but you've been to the best business school there is which is a hard reality yes and and learning the lessons that transition from the mindset of of occupation or vocation mm -hmm. there's a huge transition there and you learned how to do that what about just the switching of the identity of of being ministry versus being restaurant right i mean because when you're working in a church you already have a title you have a role, right? And mm -hmm. it's given to you. You're a pastor. So, in, you know, obviously people are coming to you. You don't really need to go out. I mean, people are coming to church. When you go into a community, they know your identity as a pastor. Um, here, none of that matter. 
You know, it was like, I thought I had to take off the pastor's hat and now I'm, I'm a business owner. Um, but it never left. I never felt like it was either this or that. Um, it was like I was wearing two hats all the time. You know, how do I, how do I become a pastor in a way without using the, the church language? <laughs> Because well, I, it, it reminds me of when, so I, I worked in Christian ministry camps and then like I was a, I was a pastor for a short time in a church up in Monterey. And then I worked, went into doing leadership and organizational development in a corporation. And honestly, there are many times I felt more like a pastor in that role in the exactly. conversations I'd have with people and in growth and development. And then, then I was when I was a pastor and when I was a pastor, I never got to hear any of the really good jokes. Exactly. That's true. And, and, you know, people are honest with you because they don't know. I mean, people didn't know I, I had a, a ministry background. So obviously they thought it was really interesting that I would sit down and talk to these people and listen to their, you know, problems, pray with mm -hmm. them. And, you know, um, yeah. And I didn't have to say what my background was. I didn't have to tell them that I was Christian. I just was present. It was just present, you know, ministry, right? You, you're you just there with people. When people are angry that they got fired, you just sit with them and, and um, you know, you, you buy them a, a meal, you know, to comfort them. And you listen to their stories about wanting to, I mean, needing to go to the hospital because they have to get a surgery done. And, and, you know, you just say, hey, can I pray with you? You know, can I pray for you? And, um more so what that. I what I hear from you is that in your eyes, your vocation never changed. No. The mechanism changed, but your vocation yes. never did. And the language changed. And, you know, so it was, uh, it was a little more tricky. You know, I can't tell them, hey, you know, I never um, told them, hey, you got to go to church. I mean, there was none of that. Uh, but they came to me. If they had a problem, I mean, question about faith or their spirituality, they came and wanted to chat you know um but i love the fact that people were just being real you know and there was in churches people know how to behave because they're in a church and they know exactly what to share what pastor and what not to share well here everything was raw everything yeah. was like, Whoa. When, when i was doing outdoor programs and this is probably one of the bigger compliments i got was that we'd be sitting around either like after program or whatever, we'd be around the campfire and, and people, these, they're either really uh, crunchy granola types or they're bag the mountain peaks, hardcore outdoor people, whatever. And they'd be talking about, you know, those Christians, not you, John, but those Christians. And that was like a huge compliment to me because they could say whatever they were feeling in front of me, knowing that I would get it. Mm, yeah. And I think that's where I feel like, Hey, this is my real ministry. Not that parish ministry isn't. It just, you know, I think God placed me or I, I, I don't want to say God placed me here, but I'm here and God is using this opportunity to continue that ministry in a very different way that I'm not familiar with. I feel very safe in a church. I know how to work in a church. I know how to deal with Christians in a church, but this, it just completely threw me you know off right I'm like out of the box wow like I don't know what to do but hey you know this is how you are trusting God and you're you know praying every day going God just you know help me as I'm making decisions um this sermon is what you pray for all the time because in restaurant business you're making decisions every single day you know, it's not one, but I mean, it is, I mean, you're firing people, you're hiring people, there are things that happen, you have to decide, hey, can you let this person in, in your establishment, or do you tell them, sorry, you can't come in, you know, and, and there's just so much struggle that goes in and out, um, and all these situational things happen, where you go, what do I wear, the pastor's hat, or <laughs> business person, you know. Well, tell but, me a little bit about what did, like, what did your training and experience in the Christian context or in the parish context, what did, how did that help you uh, in your restaurant? And then also like what was left out, what was missing? If you can articulate that. <sighs> um, 
I think not so much my training. Well, I guess, yes, training. Uh, for me, I have always been uh, interested in Christian um, counseling, family counseling, uh, and family education, Christian education, that those were my focus. And um, just sitting with people, you know, um, and my job, it made it very clear to me that my job was not to convert anyone because I can, I don't have that, you know, that's not my job. Right. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, that's God's job. I don't need to think about that. What I do want to do is when God somehow brings someone into my life in this time and space, this opportunity, how do I, how do I let them know that I'm here? And how do I care for them in a way that they feel cared for and loved? Now, I'm not saying that that's always been received that way, uh, but it was almost like present ministry. Okay, I just need to be with people in their pain, you know, when they are at their worst. I mean, the stories that they tell me and I have to sit with them to talk about their marriage life, their career and, you know, um, their struggles, you know, with narcotics and, you know, alcohol. Uh, it, I was in ministry, you know, and I felt very blessed actually to be in that place uh to be with people um so for me it was very humbling as a christian and in my training you know um i remember my professor brown she always said you know um you know don't ever think you're in control you know because if the minute you think you're in control you've already lost it <laughs> yeah. and i said that's true I, I don't have control of anyone else other than myself so um, I think being in this place for almost 20 years, 18, I think 20 years, um, I feel like I've grown a lot um, in that you know, um, I've learned more about myself, I think, and also God as in I don't know about God. <laughs> like the more I feel like I know about myself, Feel like I don't know who God is because God is so much bigger than that and yeah. I never want to put God in a box and say hey this is who God is you know um uh we've seen a lot of debts you know um and people in in struggles and pain and so how do you explain all that you can't you can't say hey this is God's yeah. will for you no it's it's not <laughs> And so you just say, hey, but I'm here. Let me help you. Let me help you. Sometimes that also becomes um, a burden. And, uh, you know, as I was sharing with you earlier, like, you know, you don't want to have savior complex. Like you got to save everybody <laughs> and you got to help everyone. Um, you can't predict the outcome. You don't know what's going to happen. But you know, I sleep very well at night. That's all I can say. I do what I need to do. I, you know, when people come and ask for water, I we never turn them down. I say, look, when a homeless person or anyone come and ask for a glass of water, always give it to them. When people want to come and just use the bathroom for whatever reason, don't, you know, because it's not, I mean, of course, children, you know, pregnant women, women, you know, that's different, but people do drugs, right? And we don't want to create that space. So you have to be very, um, I, I guess there's a fine line. <laughs> when do you say yes? And when do you say no? Good. It's good judgment. It's, and that's, that's yeah. probably, there's a whole nother thing I'm working on. We can talk about later, but this idea that judgment is what leaders get paid for. That's and, right. and, Learning how to improve your ability to make judgments is so crucial. Um, I want to ask you now, flip this question a little bit. What Now that you've had this 20 years, almost 20 years experience, what would you tell the you who is entering into parish ministry based on the lessons you've learned from business? What would you tell a young seminarian or somebody who's just starting off going into work in the church? Wow. Um. 
That's a very good question. And believe it or not, I have thought about that question <laughs> like many times, like, cause I, I'm on the board seminary. I see the seminarians. I'm like, if there's one thing I want to share with them, what would that be? You know, these people are eager to go into ministry, parish ministry. What can I share with them um, that they don't already know? Um, and, you know, I don't think I've ever came out with an answer. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I would say this is a journey. And, you know, um, you really need to be real with yourself and with others because people can see right through you, you know? Um, and when you have the right intentions, when you have, uh, have the right heart and you are doing what God's called you to do and be, God will take care of the rest. You know, there were times when I felt like, oh my gosh, how am I going to pay for this? You know, how, how is this going to happen? That happened a lot in the beginning, you know, um, especially during the pandemic. And it's amazing how God provides. I can say that because I've experienced it for myself. And, you know, um, and that when you don't lose hope and you just focus and see what you need to see, I mean, I think that everything will line up. It, it'll just fall in its right place, you know. Um, I think that's good advice, not only for young seminarians, but for uh, entrepreneurs and, and small business leaders and that that mindset piece. The, what I heard in that is two things. One is um, self-awareness, mm -hmm. knowing yourself and continue to know yourself to know like, you know, what's going to set you off and what makes you calm and all the, all the, these ideas around some might call it emotional uh, intelligence or whatever, but it's, it's this idea of, I continue to need to know myself. And then the other part of it is that mindset piece, which I fall victim to all the time of uh, just things don't go as I anticipate. And I immediately go, it's all wrong when really I'm holding on so tight to something that I shouldn't be that when God rips it out of my hands, I get the rope burn. And I can't blame God. It's just me about holding on too tight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's ministry is hard, you know, because people are hard. Somebody just said recently to me, God, life is just too hard. You know, um, unfortunately, I lost some uh, people, very close people, you know, and they made wrong decision. You know, and and I thought life is really painful, really hard. And, you know, um, sometimes when you're in that space, you and you feel so alone. And, you know, when you feel alone, fear kicks in and you just lose that hope. Right. When there's no hope. And fear kicks in, then there's no reason to live it's how they resort to that and it's really sad you look at what's happening around the world i i hear about all these kids uh, high school kids um you know suicide rate is so high um, and we don't hear about it uh, mental illness you know uh, is so prevalent here in our society um, but there's no safe place a place where they can find hope, where they can feel safe to be who they are, where they can process what's going on. Um, and if they can do it in church, great. You know, I, I hope all churches and all religious organizations can think about how to create that safe place for people. Uh, we live in fear. I mean, I don't watch the news anymore <laughs> after the pandemic. It's just too depressing. And every time you turn the news, I'm like, oh my gosh, all yeah. I do is just, you know, having fear, right? It's just everybody is fearful about what's going on. And 
um, I get, you know, messages here and there all the time. Oh, how are you? How are you doing in San Francisco? How do you go to work? Are you safe? You know, I mean, because uh, people are dying left and right. And I'm like, that's no different. It's happened before. <laughs> it reminds me of a couple of things. One is uh, that great philosopher, um, the, the Dread Pirate Roberts, Wesley, mm -hmm. who says, uh, life is pain, princess. Anybody who says different is trying to sell you something. <laughs> and it's flipping that assumption. It's not, and that's, I don't think that's just being hardened to the world. It's changing that assumption of in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. There's somebody who's overcome the world. That's and right. it may look, if you have the assumption that everybody, everything's supposed to go right and be easy, then you're set up for fear and you're set up for failure. But if you are ready to enjoy, enjoy the struggle, enjoy the journey, uh, I mean, any any trip that goes as planned is boring and there's no good stories. And I think about like when when you view life with all of its hiccups and stumbles and and horrible things beyond just the little bumps. When you know you're that's coming, you've you've got yourself ready for that news. And you could I love what Mr. Rogers would his Mr. Rogers mom would say look for the helpers mm. because it's only in the midst of crisis in the midst of disaster you find what the world is really like by seeing the people who are stepping up and helping and that's the real world not the ones who are hiding um uh, the ones that the, the 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 goodness of the world doesn't happen in the shelter of safety the goodness of the world happens in the midst of all the trauma mm -hmm. um and you know boats are always safe in the harbor but that's not what boats were built for you got to go out in the ocean and, and and try that out. And I see like what you're doing at Sam's and Fermentation Lab and and just being right there in the center of everything. You see like city government and these actors and but you also have the the homeless people and the addicts who are stumbling into your doorway um, at the same time. So you're seeing all that. Mm -hmm. All of it. Um, a little too much, you know, um, and. It's just hard because I I don't think it's what I'm doing. I'm actually um, blessed that I have a lot of good people in my life that I can always reach out and ask for help and ask for advice. Uh, people who are with me, my managers and my chef, they've been with me for over 10 years and they know a lot more than I do, you know? Um, so I can always rely on them uh, to make my life so much easier because they're great. And I, and I, I'm okay. Um, I love having people who are smarter than me is <laughs> that, you know, so we can all grow. Uh, it's not because I'm doing something great. Um, I just respond. I think that's what I do. I just respond. I don't, um, I don't walk away because I'm afraid. Uh, if there's one thing I can say about my leadership is that I take on the challenge as it comes. And, you know, I don't go around it, over it. I just try to go through it. Well, and in the same way, it's not that you are doing it. You put yourself in a place where you encounter these things True. and you don't run away from it. It's, uh, yeah, you're, you've, because you I could, you could put your it. restaurant in a place other than market. You know, and you could, you could now that you're, I mean, you're successfully doing things in a lot of different places and yet you're still down there and you, you not only put yourself in a place where you encounter these amazing things, you do even more in which you notice things because that, I think that's part of, I mean, somebody else could be in the same place doing the same thing and not see the people. And they're, they're working out, they might be focusing on their food, they might be focusing on their bottom line, any of those other stuff, but you put yourself there and you see the people. And I think that's one, you know, when you talk about, I use the phrase, be present and kind as you do great things. I think being present and kind is what helps you do those great things. And seeing the needs, you know, what what is it that this person needs, you know, and I think when you meet them where they are, then that kindness comes, you know, um, and the mercy and the grace comes, you know. Um, for me, 
that only comes from God, nowhere else. It's yeah. not about me. I mean, I would fail so many times. I mean, all the time, actually. But I, it's knowing that, hey, I can I can do this because I have someone who's just, you know, behind me. Um, and God's got my back, you know, and yeah. do it. And I stumble. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Uh, not even close. But um, I get up, you know, um, never lose uh, sight of that hope, uh, knowing that I'm never alone. That is one thing I've learned, that I'm never alone and I don't need to be afraid. When everybody is telling me to be afraid, I don't need to be afraid. Um, yeah, I mean, especially now with what's going on on Market Street. You know, they're like, wow, if Amazon Whole Foods can't survive, how, how do you how do you survive on Market Street? Everybody is shutting down. You know, why don't you move? I mean, there's all these, come down to Monterey Bay, go up to Napa, open up a place here. You don't have to deal with all the craziness. I'm like, I don't feel called away from it. I feel like this is still the place I need to be. This is my mission, you know, spot. And I really see that there is potential you know, for this place to um, to become something great and for us to be the beacon. Of yeah, the there's got to be a light in the darkness. That's There's got to be something there. And people find that here, you know, and I think that's, it's not so much, you know, hey, you're making money. No, it's not even about that. When people tell me how I am so at peace when I come here, you know, it's like outside is crazy, but inside I find so much peace. I can eat, I can rest. This is my like little haven or, you know, oasis, you know, in the desert. I, I just feel like, hey, we've done our job. You know, we created a place. So many uh, tourists, you know, who come from overseas, they come and they come not only one time to visit, but they come five, six times. Even when we tell them, hey, you got to go check out this restaurant, go over here, you'll experience this. They keep coming back. And, you know, I realize even though they're far away, they are looking for something that's familiar, what, what resembles a home. And they find Sam's to be their home away from home. Um, then, you know, I feel like, hey, I've, I've done what I needed to do. To I know home. that like, Sam's is a must go to whenever we go up to San Francisco, we've got to stop by and uh, you do such a good job of taking care of us when um, to, to wrap things up. I like to do kind of a lightning round or quick answers. So know that that these answers, you're not signing a contract on. You can change your mind anytime you want, but it's whatever comes to mind right now. Mm -hmm. And the first one, um, what is your favorite book or media that you like to give as a gift? Like what was the last book you gave away? that I gave away. Right. Um, uh, I, this is going to sound very, very weird, but I gave away uh, one of my books. Um, it just, this is so strange, but I had it in my shelf and it was a book called You Can Make a Difference by Tony Campolo. I know um, it. And someone who was really struggling with alcohol. And I just gave it to him. I said, look, you just know that you are more than this. You know, um, I want you to find yourself and read it. You know, I know you're not a Christian. This has nothing to do with just Christianity. Just read it, you know. And I, so for me, it's great when you come to my office there are a lot of books here and i i love to give them out um even the ones i didn't read yet um, <laughs> but that's something that really stands out to me uh because it's a book that i have for a very long time i think for like 30 40 years yeah um so next question here tell me who maybe one or two of your heroes and again i know there's probably a bunch of people out there for you but tell me about one of your heroes. Like you said, John, there's so many. Um, I would say, 
my heroes, one of my heroes. Um, I want to say my mom, but I, you know, I, I think many, many of us can say, hey, that's my mom. Um, this may come as a surprise, but, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really into politics at all, but right. someone that I truly uh, respect and see as a mentor uh, is a politician, believe it or not. Um, and the, Fiona Ma is a California state treasurer. Um, and I've known her for a very long time, over 20 years before she stepped into politics. Um, she and I went to the same church um, and I was doing her marriage counseling. <laughs> So that, you know, uh, we go way back, we reconnected, and I've been following her, meeting her, but um, she has just been such a good mentor for me, you know, lately, and she's always been there. It's really about, you know, um, keep your promise. When you make a promise, keep it. Don't wait, you know, and and uh, what she said to me was, you need to get rid of all the toxic people <laughs> in your life and create room for those that you need to care for. And, you know, because don't try to make everybody happy is what she was saying. You know, that's that's not your job. You're, you can't have everybody love and accept you. You just have to um, do what you need to do. You know, you can only do so much. But she has uh, always been there for me. Uh, and so I would say she's my, I think it changes, you know, but right now during the pandemic and now she's been my, um, big hero. That's great. She doesn't hey, last, <laughs> yeah. She oh Well, this could all get out to my dozens of followers. So, you know, she won't know it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll hashtag her or something. Um, last, last one of these ones, uh, who, or what do you find yourself quoting most a movie author leader? Who do you quote quote most often? So <laughs> um, that's funny because um, I was thinking about that the other day because one of my favorite animation uh, is Lion King. And Lion King is coming to Orpheum Theater this year. So I started thinking about that. And and there's a scene that always gets to me, and I've preached about this too, where the father Mufasa is, you know, telling his son, you know, remember who you are, you know. Um, and for me, that's that has always stuck with me because when we are busy, when we are out doing whatever we need to do, we forget who we really are and where we came from. Um, so it's a good reminder that sometimes we just need to step back and remember who we are and whose we are. Yeah. That, that, so my son, Pax, is really into this thing. Uh, there's another Disney thing called Lion Guard. Oh. Where it's okay. it's Simba's son and daughter. And like Lion Guard is, uh, is this group of different animals that are keeping the, the pride land safe and all that kind of stuff. And, oh and, uh, I can't remember the name of the the young lion, but he is always talking with Mufasa, and that's one of the themes of, of you know the 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 lion guard. He has this huge roar. Whenever he does the big roar, all the lions of the past join in, and it's like a superpower thing. But yeah, I'm getting tingles just thinking about that. So oh, I gotta watch it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. Well, Jeannie, thank you so much for carving out time. And I really appreciate our conversation here. It was fun reconnecting and connecting and, and learning a little bit more about what was behind you. I'd hope to maybe talk a little bit about the first time we met or uh, or the fact that you did our wedding in bilingual, all that kind of stuff. But we'll have to save that for later. But yeah. for right now, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you so much, John. It's, it's always fun to uh, catch up with you. I do.